This is part two of our interview with Chet Gallagher. If you haven't heard part one, go listen to episode seven. Now, I have been a police officer almost 20 years, the last 10 years almost in Las Vegas. I'm three months from being vested for my early retirement, a month or so before January of 1989. And um, I'm dealing with, I'm just going to be honest with you, I was really looking for a way out. Uh, I was a coward. I was, I thought, you know, this, there's got to be another plan. I mean, I, it didn't take much to figure out where this is going to go. The rescue's come to Las Vegas, much less if I'm on duty. And so the first thing I tried to do is get some time off. Didn't get the time off because I'd used up all my time when I went to Atlanta, Georgia a few months earlier for three weeks. So I had to work. So uh, I thought, well, that's, that's not real good, but okay. And then I had Christians coming up to me, um, to your point, um, and saying, you know, Chet, God wants you to be a, a good steward of what he's given you. Don't do anything, at least for the next three months, and get, be sure you secure your retirement. I mean, you'll be, he's provided this for you, you've worked for you, even though it's an early retirement, not a full retirement, still will be a benefit for you, you know, for the rest of your life. You just can't throw that away. And I thought, boy, that's the will of God. It has to be your will, Lord. And I'm telling you, in a nanosecond, it's like the Spirit of God came to me and said, Chad, imagine this, a conversation down the road, months or a year from now. Some girl comes up to you and says, you know, Chad, on that day I had my baby killed. You weren't there. Maybe if you'd been there, I wouldn't have. Why weren't you there? And I would say, well, I had to be a good steward and, and get my retirement. And she would respond and say, but I have a dead baby. And all I could say is I have my retirement. Now the Holy Spirit, who is appropriately called the Hound of Heaven, in a poem by that name, was so gentle and so loving so as not to let me off the hook. So, the rescue comes, I go to work that day, and as I attend the briefing, my sergeant, well, actually with an acting sergeant, my other sergeant was on vacation, the acting sergeant, pulls me aside and says, uh, Chet, listen, we know where you stand on this abortion issue. And I don't know if you know it or not, but there's an abortion protest that just started at this abortion facility uh, in your district. So I'm going to save you any kind of a conflict. I'm going to reassign you to uh, another part of the county to work and don't you go anywhere near that abortion clinic. Am I clear? I said, I understand. And so he turned and walked away. And I said, thank you, Lord. At the last minute, you answer all my concerns. Surely it's true. You would never ask me to disobey my superiors. To which came this word, and who's your superior, Chet? He just would not let me off the hook. He was not going to let me miss the opportunity. You're my superior, Father. Thank you for reminding me of that in this moment. So against orders of my sergeant, I obeyed my superior, my God, and I drove my motorcycle to the parking lot of that abortion clinic. And there was, sitting in front of the door of the abortion clinic, 92 Christians, moms and dads, college students, medical professionals, 10 pastors, and more. 
And there's a line of 50 police officers that were lining up, getting ready to start arresting them. Now, I had fasted for three days prior to this happening, prior to this scenario that I was walking into. It was probably the easiest fast that I had ever in my life. It was a glorious time. It was just something that, because it was so simple, simple, you know, and so private, and it just was, it effectively did an effective work in me. So I walked through, I remember I drove up with my motorcycle, and, and I uh, got off the motorcycle, and I took a few steps, and I turned around, <laughs> and I went back to that motorcycle, and I, I patted it on the tank like I was patting my dog on the head. You know, like I was saying goodbye to a friend or whatever. I mean, I knew where this is likely to go. So I walked through this line of, of police officers, TV cameras, men and women singing, worshiping God, sitting at the door of the abortion clinic. And I walked up to the guy who was leading the rescue. Now, the guy that was leading the rescue was one of the pastors that I'd shown this video to. And, and he got it right away. He just, he, he knew. And he actually had resigned the night before, not resigned, he had taken his retirement the, officially the night, that night before. This was a Saturday morning. On Friday, he went in, and retired from his job. And I walked up to him, his name is Russ Danes, and I asked him for this little bullhorn that he was using to give directions to everybody. Now, Russ Danes was a bivocational pastor. His full-time job was the administrative police lieutenant for the North Las Vegas Police Department, who so got this that he was going to lead the rescue, though he determined, he decided to, to take his, he was, he was eligible for his full retirement, and, and so he, he secured his retirement and, and led the rescue. Uh, godly man, wonderful guy. A lot of people don't know that part of the story. And I don't know what happened to him. Anyway, I took this bullhorn from him, and I, I read from a statement that I had put together, and um, had shown it to a couple of people, a couple of pastors. And in that statement, I basically made a plea with my fellow officers. They're lined up there. The rescuers are sitting on the ground behind me, and some at the back door. And so. I'm reading this to the police, and it basically I'm saying I've decided to use my discretion doing an investigation and knowing that these people are here protecting innocent human life, and that if we arrest them and take them away from the door, that the babies that are out there in the parking lot will be brought in here and will be killed. If we don't arrest them, then nobody has to die. And as a police officer, I'm using my discretion, choosing not to participate in the arrest of these Christians, but to stand with them. I waxed eloquent for about two minutes. My supervisors were not at all impressed. Sergeant came up to me and, uh, on the orders of the lieutenant. He says, Chet, you're suspended. Leave this area immediately. That was the defining moment. Because, see, I could have done that. I could have said, I did everything I could do. God's turned it over to the hands of these amazing people sitting behind me at the door of the abortion clinic. I've made a plea, a biblical plea to my fellow police officers. I could do all of that, still save my job, obey this order to go back under suspension, probably get a few days off without pay, a letter of reprimand in the department, but I still would be a police officer. But in that moment, this is what the grace of God gave me to say. I told Steve, Steve Tuggle was his name, the sergeant. I said, you know, Steve, I, I know you're not convinced of killing children on the other side of this door where these people are sitting. Uh, my dilemma is, is that I'm absolutely convinced. And because of that, not as a Christian, though you know I am, I'm certainly not any kind of a protester, 
But as a police officer, I cannot walk away from what I know to be a murder in progress. So I was the first one arrested that day in uniform on national TV. Ephesians says this in chapter 6, having done all to stand. Stand firm, therefore. <laughs> now there's only the grace of God could ever bring all of that to happen. And that's the bottom line. It's not about the babies. It's about the babies, but it's not about the babies because every one of those babies, if we believe the scripture, is Yeshua Jesus saying, whatever you do to the least of those, you do to me. Now what are you gonna do? So they took me to jail and they stripped me of my badge and my gun, my uniform, and put me in a orange jail jumpsuit and I awaited the arrival of all the other rescuers, which they eventually came, 92 of them, half of them men, half of them women, some teenagers, some elderly. And so the men, there were 40 of us, exactly 40, interesting, exactly 40 of us, and they put us into a, a cell block, about twice the size of this area right here, packed in there. <laughs> And so these pastors, one was a Catholic priest, and he was sitting on the trash can, and he was kind of kicking his legs back. He says, you know, Chet, in all my lives as a priest, I've never felt more like a priest than I do today. He was a senior, a monsignor, in one of the Catholic parishes there, neat guy. This amazing church service is going on, and these guys are pre preaching like they've never preached before, and people are singing, and I'm telling you, I can't sing a hoot. Even in the shower, I don't sound good, but when you're in a room like that with 40 men, the steel and concrete, it beats any shower you've ever sung in. And so right in the middle of this church service, about every 30 minutes or so, the door would open, and they'd throw in some guy who'd been arrested for drunk driving or petty larceny or domestic abuse, whatever. <laughs> and one by one, these guys are getting saved. We call it the first unlawful assembly of God church. <laughs> really, <laughs> the first unlawful assembly of God church. And I, I experienced jail ministry like I'd never seen. I mean, some of it in Atlanta. I mean, when we were there for those 18 days in the Key Road prison back in October, you know, we witnessed and baptized guys in the shower. And, I believe in immersion, you know, but there's water, you know, what are you going to do? When my wife learned on television, national news that night, that her pro-life Christian cop husband had the audacity to do something so outrageous, she divorced me. Broke my heart. So they had a hearing a week later and uh, fired me. Well, I just uh, decided to continue doing rescues around the country and people were being edified and encouraged by the testimony and many opportunities arose and so I, I did that. I had no idea where she went. She, Joanne took her retirement and left town and took our little RV. And, but later on, when we did a rescue during Holy Week of probably the following year, um, hundreds of rescuers, uh, there was a man by the name of Bob Vernon. Bob Vernon was uh, the assistant deputy chief of police of LAPD and at John MacArthur's church. And um, he, uh, had been in Las Vegas, we invited him to come and uh, to speak at our group of the Fellowship of Christian Peace Officers. Really one of the most, one of the most frequently requested family, Bible-believing conference speakers in the country. Very, very, and a great guy, great guy. And I got to enjoy really getting to know him. 
he went to his uh, pastor, to John MacArthur, seeking some advice. What do I do? You know, here my officers are going to be arresting hundreds of these Christians, and you know. So John went to his elder board, and the elder board basically told um, MacArthur to tell Rob, Bob, Bob Vernon, Chief Vernon, just to do his job. That's the police officer treat him like, like they treat any other criminals. And so with that advice, he really made some really bad mistakes. It was one of the brutalest rescues that I had ever participated in. And I, had, so Vernon was across the street and they'd already arrested some of the, the leaders. And so it was my turn to do that. And I had the head, the, uh, the bullhorn. So I'm speaking to him and reminding him that, you know, you don't remember, but I do remember, you know me and I know you. And this is when you were there. And why are you doing this, what you're doing, you know? And, and, and those are probably some really direct words that he really struggled with. Um, and I meant for him to struggle with them. Um, because he'd made the statement in a Jim Dobson interview, I'm a Christian, but when I put on my uniform, I'm a cop. But Bo, did you know that between 1987 to 1994, that in America there were over 70,000. The number is actually upwards to 77,000 arrests of Christians for sitting in front of the doors of the abortion clinic. I was in Mississippi and I was speaking at a pro-life banquet there and uh, I asked that question to those people, 500 of them sitting at round tables celebrating the CPC and everything they did. I asked that question. Three people raised their hand in that crowd of people. It's always amazed me. I, it's amazing that people just don't know. Why don't they know? We use the media as effectively as we could. Great stories in the media came forth. People's lives were changed. And so we decided that um, I should go before the Civil Service Board and appeal the decision of the sheriff to fire me. And I did, but it took six months before they would hear it. But they ultimately did hear it. And they gave me my job back. Yeah. yeah. You think that's an expression of shock. You should have seen the other officers in the room that were sitting there as well. Me included. I had no idea that would happen. So we rejoiced, and it was, uh, it was amazing. They didn't agree with me at the Civil Service Board. They just thought that an officer had a pretty good reputation in the career. God bless the Lord for making that happen that he was uh, being terminated for something, an act of conscience, not really worthy of being terminated without pay. But the sheriff immediately called the judge, Robert Mosley, in, in district court and, and filed an appeal against the Civil Service Board's decision to send me back to work the next morning. So I never went back to work. And that took three months to be hurt. And then finally, at the end of nine months after the rescue, the judge makes the announcement and it's settled and Chet's no longer a police officer. So I uh, decided to do a press conference outside the abortion clinic where we'd been rescuing myself and 92 others nine months earlier. And there are a whole slew of reporters, cameras and pictures. And, but only one reporter asked a question, only one and only one question that whole press conference. Chet, we just really want to know if you have any regrets. Are you still convinced that you made the right decision? Now this is how the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that reminded me of that conversation with that girl who said she had her baby killed, where were you? This is how he allowed me to answer the question. I'm standing in front of the cameras and I turn to Brenda who's standing next to me. She's 18 years old, but nine months earlier, she was being forced to have an abortion by her boyfriend and her mother, one she really didn't want to get, but had acquiesced to kill her child. So I turned to Brenda and asked her for Joshua. her six-week-old baby boy that was not killed nine months earlier. 
And I took Joshua and I lifted him up, held him like this in my hands, and he waved his arms and smiled and drooled all over me. And I said to that reporter who asked the question to the rest of them, I said, had it not been for the 92 Christians sitting at the door of this abortion clinic behind us, and yes, one Christian police officer, this baby, this one right here, this baby, would have been cut to pieces and ground up in the industrial garbage disposal inside this building behind us where they dispose of children. I had gone 20 years, almost 20 years, military and civilian law enforcement, could never look back at any time, Bo, where I either had, where I either had performed CPR or rushed into a burning building or pulled somebody out of a burning automobile or, and actually intervened and saved somebody's life um, until these last moments as a police officer when, along with these other Christians sitting in front of the door of this abortion clinic, this baby was not brought in. And the reason is because while they were sitting in front of the door of this abortion clinic, Brenda, who was one of those women sitting in the car in the parking lot, wasn't able to get in, but was waiting to get in. But because at every rescue, we have sidewalk counselors who meander through the parking lot or go across the street to the gas station where they've driven their car to wait or down the block, and now can talk without having to shout across the parking lot, now can talk to these women one-on-one. -on -one. And then one of the couples in the church and in the rescue took her into their home where she lived for the next several months during her pregnancy because her mother would have nothing to do with her and her boyfriend left her. She was one to Christ. Joshua, that little six-week-old baby boy, is now uh, nearly 35 years of, old, uh, of age and has two sons of his own. Those two sons that he has would never have been born. So Joshua wasn't one the only one that was saved that day. A lot of salvations took place. But I ended up being in jail in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, a pastor, a friend of mine, and I violated the judge's order. The judge had compelled us after the rescue not to go back, he put us on six months sentence suspended. And, um, but we did anyway, and so she violated us, and uh, we had to go to jail to serve those six months. So I'm in jail in Fargo, North Dakota. Been in jail for a month or so. And man, I'm missing my wife. Had no contact with her for a year, two years almost. So I'm calling Jamie, our youngest daughter, and the phone collect, and we're talking. One day I said, no, Jamie, I just, I'm so lonely for your mom. I just gotta really, I've gotta get talk to her. Just, she says, I know, but she just won't. She just won't, won't talk to you. So we'll try again. Call her and let her know that we've had this conversation and that. I'm going to call you back tomorrow and see what her answer is. So I prayed and prayed and prayed. Don't know if I even slept that night. I probably did, but not straight through. Couldn't wait to get to the phone and call Jamie. Yeah, I did. I told her. She's really excited. She wants you to call her. She's hiding out with, with Aunt Sandy in South Carolina. And here's her phone number. She's waiting for your call. So I did. And, you know, she was pleasant on the phone and a little bit of small talk at first and it's good to talk to you. And, but I could just tell in the tone of her voice that there was something really different. That she had something she wanted to tell me. And she didn't really know how she was going to do it. She said, what you don't know is that long before we ever met, I'd had, uh, I'd had one abortion. Well, actually, Two, I've had three abortions. 
that secret had literally held her hostage for 25 years. I was so blessed that not only she would have already obviously confessed that to the Lord, but this time in a real way. Because before, I mean, when she tells the story, you know, it was three DNCs, no big deal. Between me and God, abortion's wrong, yeah, I know, but, you know, we worked it out. But then something had happened. There was genuine, heartfelt repentance and grief. So I proposed to her from jail. <laughs> And on the phone, I didn't get down on one knee. You know, sometimes I get asked that question, I just... But she said, yes, but I'm in jail. And so I write the letter to the judge. Georgia Dawson was her name. She was this probably pro-abortion judge who violated this and sent myself and my pastor friend into, into jail. I wrote her a letter and said, Judge Dawson, my wife has had a complete change of heart. And more importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ has done a miracle in my marriage. I proposed to her on the phone, and she's agreed to remarry me. So I would like you to give me permission to cross state lines, to go from Fargo to Minneapolis. My wife will fly up from South Carolina to meet me in Minneapolis. And on New Year's Eve, we'll be remarried. I read, I read that letter to the inmates before I sent it to the judge, and they all roared. There's no way that that judge is going to do that. But she did. So somebody drove me from Fargo. Joanne flew up from South Carolina. We were married, had a one-day honeymoon, and then she drove me back to jail the next day. The story couldn't end any better than that. But there's another kind of kicker. My retirement. <laughs> A year later, I found out that even police officers who'd been fired could pay into the retirement system. So for $2,900, I bought the three, year, three months rather that were remaining. And so since... Uh, February of 1991, I have been receiving a check from the state of Nevada, so I'm both a fired and a retired police officer. But see, the Lord didn't tell me that, right? He could have, and I'm so glad he didn't because King David says it best. He says, I will never sacrifice anything to the Lord that doesn't cost me something. This story and how he transitioned me out of law enforcement into this ministry has been the beginning of one of the most amazing kingdom adventures I could ever imagine participating in. To God be the glory. Remember, I was the coward who was trying to get out of it, trying to listen to all the legitimate excuses and very reasonable people coming up to me to prevent this from happening. And, would have patted me on the back if I'd taken their advice and missed all of this. I was actually talking to some friends uh, on a call just this last week. and This kind of thing came, came to mind. I recalled that, and I told them, you know, that, and I really believe that, you know, abortion is an issue of sin. You're not going to solve sin in the political or cultural arena. I thank God for the witness of that, and it's certainly something I haven't run from, but the solution is not political. It just isn't. And some of these guys have just gone way off of this political realm. So I was telling them, gentlemen, listen, nowhere in this book, from cover to cover, does God ever refer to the disenfranchised, the helpless, and the orphan as the motherless, but always as the fatherless. Abortion is an issue of failed fatherhood. And just because the world wants to make it all about the mother and all about the woman, 
we as men know that we have to be the courageous men that God's called us to be and to fight these on his terms and not on the political term, you know. Um, kind of a little bit to go along with that as what was it like at home? You're raising a family, you have a wife, um, she hasn't divorced you yet. Uh, all of these amazing things are happening in your life. Mm -hmm. What does is, what is your home life look like during that time? So, um, you know, I talked about failed fatherhood before. I don't take that lightly. You know, I've got more failures and successors in, in, in fatherhood. And so when, when there's a calling, things change and there are consequences. And a lot of times children don't even understand much less when they're children. Not to say it's still not difficult for them when they're adults. I have as many regrets in that, in that area of fatherhood as I do in the challenges that face all of us in this particular battle. Don't understand it, why it's that way, you know. Why does Paul Vaughn get to have a son-in-law like you? Because Paul's made some really great decisions and God is still using him. And it's not to take away or add to anything that he's done and I haven't and vice versa. Um, but I am thankful that he, Paul, and Cal, and the dozens of other men who I live my parental life through vicariously uh, have dealt with these same questions themselves. And here we are in the middle of another great adventure that's going to be playing out and who knows what the Lord is going to do. Who knows what the Lord is going to do. Because I have experienced some amazing times in jail, but none like the last time when it took him five weeks to get me back from South Carolina. And I was in federal custody for all that time and the things that God did and the men that I was able to minister to, just as a sweet reminder of what he did in the past, he'll do much more in the future. And how can I let men die in their prison cells and burn in hell forever if the door is going to open for me to go in and share the gospel? That's the reality. It's not really a dilemma. It's only a dilemma is if I try to rescue myself. When they were rescuing slaves, and for years it was a misdemeanor for a slave to be rescued from its slave holder, um, they brought about the Fug Federal Fugitive Slave Act, which made it a federal felony to rescue slaves. And a lot of people stopped. But genuine heroes continued rescuing slaves despite the fact that it had become a federal offense. The federal government is, has been as successful in squashing the attempts to rescue with the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances federal bill but that's where we are. We really do have to obey God rather than man. And whether we've actually done that and understand it in that context as this binding oath, the closer we come to him, we end up making those promises the way we should, and that's out of love, not out of duty. Duty is important, but he said if you Abide in me, abide this way, abide in my love. The way that you abide in my love is you keep my commandments. That's in John chapter 15 in the verse, in the parable, the powerful parable of he's the vine, we're the branches. Apart from him we can do nothing, right? So it's got to be, it has to really transcend duty. Now, I have all kinds of reasons to mention duty and the dutiful acts that we perform and it's 
my duty to do this, and I'm sworn to do this. So he says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Think not that I came to destroy the law. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and teach men to do likewise, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So I'm not pursuing greatness, but I'm certainly trying to avoid leastness in the kingdom. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do it to me. Greater love hath no man than this, and he lay down his life for his friend. So if I really want to be abiding in his love, it's not just enough to keep his commandments, so it's fruit of that, but I'm abiding in his love for the sake of others, and it may cost me the same thing that it cost him. Because when he says, pick up the cross, your cross. <laughs> Not my cross. I've already picked up my cross, but you get to pick up your cross daily and follow me. How far? To the death. And when we get prepared and experience the privilege thing is that I and so many others have been privileged by his grace to experience, that's really not a fearful thing. It's really not a fearful thing. The question is, how can I do that in such a way that it first honors him and encourages others to believe it and to walk it out? Francis Schaeffer wrote a book, okay? How then shall we live? I'm glad you're nodding your head. That's an important question to be able to answer when we stand before him. Blessed be the name of the Lord the Lord God Most High, who privileges us to lay down our life for him and others. It's just normal Christianity, guys. <laughs> it really is just normal Christianity. We've just missed it. And what we're going through is to be dim in comparison. And Paul did say, I desire to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Glory to God. On October 5th of 2022, the same morning that Paul Vaughn was raided by the FBI, Chet's home was also raided. He wasn't there when it happened because he was in South Carolina visiting family. As soon as he learned about the charges, he willingly turned himself over to federal agents. Once in custody, the U.S. Marshals took 28 days to transport Chet from South Carolina to the federal courthouse in Nashville so that he could be arraigned. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to Stifled Cry wherever podcasts are found to be notified when new episodes are published. Help us get the cry out by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media and leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. Please help us make the cry louder by supporting us at stifledcry.com.